Thank you all for coming to the session called The Future of Education. I'm Yoshi Hori of Globis, uh, which we run business school and venture capital. And we're happy, I'm so happy to be moderating this session with great panelists. Let me introduce you to the panelists. Um, Mr. Gordon Brown, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Ms. Ma Mark uh, Shantanu, uh, Shantanu Shuan, President, oh sorry, Shantanu from, uh, I'm sorry about from that, <laughs> from uh, Educomp, and uh, also uh, uh, Tan Kian, Tan Kian, Mr. Dr. Tan Kian from uh, UNESCO, and we have uh, uh, Mark Kamlet from uh, a Provost of Carnegie Mellon University, and we have Dr. Tan Cho Chuan from uh, Singapore University, uh, uh, National University of Singapore. And uh, this is a topic to balance between tradition and innovation. Education needs to be thinking about what to remain and what to change. I am sitting on the Global Agenda Council of New Model of Leadership. We talk about the leadership. There are about 70 plus agenda councils on WF, and they, they all talk about the leadership. We lack leadership, so we have to think about what are the role of new model of leadership. And that are the main subjects. And then changes happening in terms of globalization, technology, and also generation changes, and multi-stakeholder issues are coming up. And therefore, education has to do something to keep up with the changes of the pace of the world. With that, I'd like to structure this uh, uh, session into four. One is to talk about what are the pending issues facing education. And second is to talk about what is the information technology is doing. And third is to talk about what is the interdisciplinary approach is needed. And fourth is to talk about what is the universities. And then we'll talk about the overall issues. I will ask uh, Mr. Gordon Brown to talk about you know, the, all the overall issues. And then we'd like to open up for discussions. We have five panelists in one hour, and I was asked to make, uh, to make a Q&A session earlier, so that I'd like to engage the audience. First of all, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Tang about the pressing issues with current education models. Well, thank you. Uh, from UNESCO's point of view, uh, the microphone is on, it's okay. Uh, from UNESCO's point of view, uh, I can think about the four issues uh, at the global level. The first one is uh, unbalanced the provision of education, uh, which is means uh, you have a quite different uh, a provision of education from different countries, from uh, developed countries, and uh, then compare with the uh, LDC countries. And even we've seen the same countries from different regions, like the urban region and the rural region, you find a big difference on the provision of education. So this is the first issue I'd like to raise, which is how what kind of a policy government should adopt to address this kind of unbalanced approach. The second issue I would like to say is uh, in the last 20 years, the access to education at the global level is significantly improved. Compared 10 years ago, uh, about 70 million more children are in school today. Although school today, we still have about 60 million uh, school children outside of school, but still Today, we can see the big difference compared to 10 years ago. However, the quality of education is today's biggest challenge. So it's necessary to find the, the, the policy attention from access to quality. This is the second issue I like to raise. The third issue I think I like to raise is that today's is a lack of a provision of a lifelong learning concept. So when we have people talking about education, sometimes we're talking about a higher education, sometimes talking about you know, formal education, but you have to talk about education in a lifelong learning uh, concept, from early childhood to primary, vocational, secondary, higher education, literacy, and adult learning. What is the government policy to promote lifelong learning system in their country? This is the third issue I'd like to raise. The last issue I'd like to say is that today's education, I don't think they can, they are adapt sufficient enough to the daily change of the life, the change of the social life, the change of the technology of today's world. So this is today, I think this education 
Uh, in a certain way, education people is the most conservative people. Sometimes they are talking about education in school, education in their own circle. What happened outside? They don't care much. So this is another, I think, is a challenge for many, many government to push the education people to think about what happened in the world and what happened outside and how you adapt the, the education to train what we call the new champions today. So in that way, we do need partnership with business people so then they can really have a dialogue to tell education people what kind of a people we need to train in the future. Thank very you. good. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. Dr. Tan has touched upon access, quality, lifelong learning, and also changes needed. You know, you know Dr. Tan mentioned about education, people in education are quite conservative, and maybe resisting changes. I think we have a very good panelist to talk about the issue of the changes happening in terms of educational sphere. Shantanu, you can talk about like, uh, what's happening in terms of the new uh, educational model and IT and uh, e-learning as well. Yeah, thank you. And actually picking up from, uh, from you, uh, Dr. Tang, um, you know, if you look at the whole area of access to mm. education and quality of education, uh, one of the things that's increasingly becoming very clear is that the place to spend your dollars to bring about significant and breakthrough impact is actually by leveraging uh, technology. And broadly, if I see the four areas of education that are in crisis today across the world, one is, of course, the area of primary education and K through 12. And if you see what technology is doing and what can do for K through 12, the results are, are pretty obvious. Teachers across the world are now increasingly using digital content as a part of their day-to-day -day classroom instruction. And that's creating major impact. In the area of higher education, probably online education, putting on open courseware initiative that MIT and a bunch of other universities are doing, promises to change and disrupt existing higher education models like never before. And the area of vocational education that has a direct linkage to the development of human capital across the world stands to change completely when you, say, put tablets in the hands of students because you have a very vast number of courses, you have very poor vocational training infrastructure across the world, and the connecting thread to all of these can be the powerful use of uh, education technology. Just speaking from my own experience, Educom does a lot of work at the very cutting edge of how to leverage IT for education, and some of the results that we have seen are very dramatic. Talking about K through 12, we've seen an improvement of between 25 to 30 percent in student learning outcomes just because you put the teacher in front of a computer that had high quality educational content. Across the world, we see some major problems plaguing the education sector, and policymakers are grappling with these problems. For example, the world needs many more schools than they are available today. There aren't enough teachers. There's a whole new millions of people that will enter the work stream that have no opportunity for vocational education. I can't think of anything else except efficient and effective use of technology that can be the, the big game changer and the big uh, unifying factor uh, across almost every dimension of education that we can think about today. Shantanu, for those of you who don't know about Educom, Shantanu has started a business from scratch and became a public company in India and which provides e-learning to vocational school, to business school as well, under one umbrella. Therefore, what Dr. Tan has mentioned about access versus participation, quality, or like maybe lifelong learning as well, or the changes, difficulties in changing the conservative uh, educational bodies, might, you know, like uh, this kind of uh, uh, newly startup business might be one, one of the solutions. We'd like to go on then to uh, Dr. Tan who is the president of National University of Singapore to talk about the different aspect of education, which is, uh, Shantanu has touched upon about e-learning as well as more of the private sector providing education. It's National University and, uh, and Dr. Tan will talk about what is going on in terms of interdisciplinary uh, uh, approaches happening in university. And please, Dr. Tan. I think what is clear is that uh, interdisciplinary learning will increasingly become the norm for education in the future. And there are two main reasons for this. 
The first is that uh, all of us, and uh, particularly graduates, are facing more and more complex issues all the time. And almost all of these issues will naturally cross many disciplines. So you actually need a much wider intellectual base in order to cope effectively with these types of complex issues. At the same time, people are going to do more and more jobs during the lifetime of the career. So in fact, we no longer talk about a career for life, we talk about a lifetime of careers. And these jobs may be in very different sectors. And again, you need a broader-based intellectual foundation in order to more easily upskill or reskill to take up new types of jobs in different sectors. But the critical question is, uh, how do you actually most effectively promote cross-disciplinary learning to build those critical skills uh, that are required to do so? And uh, of course, one way is to have uh, many more courses where many professors from different disciplines teach in the same course. But there are other, uh, I think, more powerful methods by which you can do so, which I think will become more and more of the mainstay in education institutions from schools up to universities. Uh, let me just mention three quick examples. The first is problem-based learning, where uh, groups of students are presented with a problem right at the beginning of the course. And in figuring out what the main issues are, in working through the problems, they will naturally have to learn across disciplines. So for example, if you take the problem of obesity, you can look at it from a healthcare point of view, how it's defined socially, you can consider how perception of risks occur at individual level about health problems associated with obesity, how uh, design of uh, the built environment can affect obesity and so on. So problem-based learning can be a very powerful way to stimulate interest in subjects and also to, in a sense, naturally lead people to think about across disciplines without consciously considering that they're doing so. Another uh, different type of approach which we have uh, found to be very useful has really been to uh, try to maximize the mix of disciplines among students in the classroom and to specifically design courses that make use of this diversity in order for students to learn from each other across disciplines. So in my university, for example, we have uh, several programs where we have groups of students drawn from many different disciplines engaged in seminar-style courses that explore carefully selected topics. For example, the elements of uh, sustainable urbanization or livable cities. And immediately you'll find that uh, students quite often will experience small aha moments when they hear issues uh, brought up by their colleagues, their fellow students who come from a different disciplinary background. And finally, on the issue of IT, online, or technology-based learning, in fact, it can be a very powerful adjunct supplement to these types of approaches because uh, it allows, actually, students to learn at their own pace and their own time the foundational knowledge, the types of basic information that they need so that when they come to the classroom for the face-to-face -face interaction, they will be able to spend that time uh, framing problems, debating issues, and trying to find creative solutions. So in the end, it, I think it was going to be the combination of online education, technology-enhanced education, together with uh, new modes of learning in the classroom that will allow us to train up this uh, critical thinking and cross-disciplinary uh, knowledge that is so, going to be so important for uh, the products of the educational process in the future. I think this is a very interesting discussion in the way that the Shantanu is a public company, so he has to think about efficiency. Efficiency uh, in a way that a uh, uh, you know, public company has to make profit. And in a way that uh, in terms of e-learning and IT will enhance efficiency. On the other hand, interdisciplinary you know, education requires more complex process and need to, require, need to involve and engage lots of the different you know, uh, scientists and people and professors and could become inefficient. But uh, at the same time, the world is becoming more complex, therefore you know, we have to cater to the good quality education, access, participation, and at the same time, you have to think about what is required in terms of education. So I'd like to go on to Mark.
to talk about as a provost of Carnegie Mellon University to combine like efficiency as well as the changing dynamic of the world and then how do the universities coping it and how do you see it happening? Thanks. Well, I'd like to begin with uh, higher education in the developed world and then move more globally. In the developed world, um, a lot of institutions of higher education are between a rock and a hard place, uh, to use the proverbial uh, 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 phrasing, uh, particularly those that are publicly financed. Uh, in higher education, there, has not, there have not really been productivity changes in the last thousand years. We deliver education largely the same way we, we always have. That leads to something that's often called Baumol's disease, but it uh, uh, means that the cost of higher education relative to other goods and services is going to continue to grow, and we have seen tuition costs continue to rise. That's now being coupled with an unwillingness or an inability of the public to continue to finance and to pay for and to subsidize the higher education activities to the degree to which they traditionally have. And this has led, uh, in the United States, in Great Britain, many places, great pressures for the need to change, radically change the cost curve for higher education, that the current system is not in a stable equilibrium. Now, one way to do this, and we've heard great examples uh, in the panel today, is, is through technology, and in particular through online learning, through distance learning. And one way this can be done is through lectures. This is certainly not new. This has been an approach that's been pursued for, for, for decades and decades, and it can be uh, very powerful. It's also gotten a huge amount of attention recently, as we heard reference to the MOOCs, these massively online open courses. And they do have the potential to provide access very broadly to lectures at a very low marginal cost. But such access alone, I think, is likely to prove to be uh, insufficient. And I think that there is an approach that's been developed over the past 30 years, which I want to uh, mention and which I think is going to be central to the evolution of higher ed. And it involves combining cognitive psychology, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. One of the things we know from cognitive science of learning taught us over and over that passively watching and listening to lectures can sometimes be a pretty ineffective way to learn, to learn an ineffective way to grasp and master complex materials. Most students uh, need a very carefully structured learning environment with a great deal of student interaction, a great deal of learning by doing, well-designed explanation, well-designed uh, examples, and highly customized student-specific feedback. The online lectures are a, something that has many, many uses, but those aren't generally the skills that they have. An alternative approach is to embed into an interactive computer mechanism, which could actually be your smartphone, but um, a tremendous amount of customized artificial intelligence-based uh, capacity for there to be what we call a cognitive tutor, which sort of replaces or serves the place of the, the traditional lecture. Um, this is a technology that's pretty expensive compared to just taping or videoing a lecture, but it can scale very easily, and the marginal cost can be much, much lower, can also be driven down to zero or near zero. It's a very rich and a very interactive environment, and there are now many controlled studies that show that it's an alternative and a very effective way of, uh, of pedagogy, which does impact the cost curve in significant ways. I want to mention two quick examples that I'm familiar with from my institution. One of them is an organization called Carnegie Learning, which has been working in developing uh, cognitive tutors for teaching algebra to eighth graders, and is now being used are three to, five, three to 400,000 students at any given time, and has worked its way into about 
of all U.S. public school districts. Another is a, an initiative out of Carnegie Mellon called the Open Learning Initiative, which is taking some of these same principles and approaches into higher education. This approach, I think, is going to have a large role to play in higher education in develop, developed countries and affecting the cost curve, but it's going to be equally important in the developing world where it will provide great access, but also very highly customized and uh, pedagogically effective methods to proceed. Thank you, Mark. I think it's interesting to conceptualize what we have been discussing about. One is a higher education and primary education. We have technology efficiency, as well as interdisciplinary on the other side, and human touch. And then combining that with uh, uh, the, the supply model is a private enterprises versus public universities. And then you know, we have to combine, depending upon what is required in terms of the uh, needs of the world. With that, you know, Gordon, thank you for being patient. <laughs> and then with that, like, I'd like to hand over to Gordon to talk about what you thought after this discussion and what you think will be done and what your experience is in terms of education. But, but uh, can, I, can I say, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be um, speaking <laughs> alongside some of the great thought leaders uh, for the universities of the future, uh, from Singapore, from Carnegie Mellon in the States, uh, from India, running universities, as well as UNESCO. I, I actually was once a university lecturer, and universities, as you know, stand for objectivity, impartiality, rationality, the disinterested pursuit of truth, the search for knowledge, and I found that these were all the qualities I had to leave behind when I went into politics. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to start with a story. I, I was in the newest country in the world, South Sudan, but one of the poorest countries in the world only a few weeks ago. And I met mothers in that uh, country who I talked to about what were their hopes and what were their fears. And what was absolutely fascinating was even in this most remote and poor village that I was uh, uh, visiting. The mothers there, although they lacked food and shelter and safety and security for their children and themselves, what they wanted most of all was education. What they wanted for the children was the chance of education. And that is reflected in everything that you've heard already this evening, that the demand for education, the understanding of its centrality to the economy more than ever, the need to adapt to changing occupational uh, structures by training, retraining, providing constant lifelong education. The heart of the debate about the future economy of the world is about how we improve uh, and we expand our edu education system. And there's not a mother, I think, throughout the world who doesn't understand now the importance that education will have more so in the future than ever it had in the past. And therefore, there's two questions that, in a way, I want to ask uh, this audience uh, to comment on this evening. The first is this issue of access. Who gets education? Mm. So in the next 10 or 20 years, by 2030 at least, the numbers of young people who are graduates of universities will quadruple from 200 million to 800 million. Mm. China itself, as I understand it, will raise the number of its graduates mm. from 100 million to 300 million, and Aren't India will be trying mm. to do something mm. similar. So the demand for higher education will grow. The numbers of people with qualifications will grow. Well, what happens to the rest? We know they need education. We know they need qualifications, not necessarily university qualifications. But how can we continue to tolerate a situation where 60 million children today are not even going to school, not even having one day at school, when <laughs> the majority of children in some countries are not finishing secondary education? where there are still nearly a billion people in the world who are illiterate. And yet we think and agree that education is so important to a person's opportunities and to our economy's success uh, and still allow this situation uh, to exist in the world where so many people are deprived of a basic right to education. So we will have to do more about this and we will have to mobilize global support to ensure that people in some of the poorest parts of the world have the chance to get education. And then the second issue, mm, okay. what is education going to be like? And that's what this debate has, okay, has, has sure. been about. And I sometimes think, well, uh, I don't know if it's true that universities have not uh, improved their productivity for a thousand years, uh, as was suggested. 
Uh, we say in uh, Britain that the first 500 years of any institution is always the most difficult. Uh, but I do know that a lot of people would say that the classroom is basically one of the few institutions that has been relatively unchanged for more than a century. Mm. And that we still practice the same type of uh, educational uh, 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 and curriculum as we might have done a century ago in many, many countries. So can't we learn more about what is being successful and what really works? First of all, we know that good teachers matter. Uh, and we cannot afford uh, to have low quality education because we have poor teachers. We need two million more teachers, four million more classrooms in the world. But we also need quality teachers. And a school will only be as good as the quality of its teachers. Secondly, we know that leadership matters. Mm. If a school is not well led or a university or a college, it's not going to be successful. Uh, and you need good leaders and good educational leaders. The third thing we know is that you've got to balance for the modern world the need to have good skills, the three R's we call it in Britain, arithmetic and reading mm. and writing, of course, the basic skills, and good skills in maths and science, where Asia is doing far better than the rest of the world and should be congratulated, but also with a creativity in the curriculum that will allow people to learn how to learn and learn how to adapt. And so the how you learn is as important sometimes as what you learn. Mm. And it seems to me we need to learn from what is successful in creating a curriculum that is both based on the discipline of the uh, basic sciences, but also the creativity of the pupil. And the question is, can that be done also by maintaining equity for the individual pupil? And then this final point, which has come up about technology, it seems to me absolutely crucial. And I suppose I would put the challenge this way. Technology has got the capacity to transform the educational experience, and we've just heard how it could be done. The teacher doesn't need to be what we call in Britain the sage on the stage. The teacher could be the guide by your side as you benefit from the new technology, and the teacher becomes more of a tutor than a lecturer as the lecturing is sometimes done better by people who've got uh, vast uh, genius in that and can be beamed in from the, the rest of the world. But how we apply this technology is important and who gets the benefit of this technology important. And really, the challenge for our educationalists is can we understand that someone who is the poorest pupil in the remotest part of the world could also get the benefit of this new technology where we can uh, have online learning so that we don't have the problems of access and the inequalities of opportunity that we have at the moment. Everywhere I go around the world, children want to learn. Children are begging to learn. Parents want them to have these chances. Teachers want things to be better. I think we should now be in a position to bring together all the lessons we're learning from the successes, whether it's Finland or China or Singapore or Carnegie Mellon, learn all the successes uh, and then try to make sure that we can at a global level, disseminate all the good uh, things that could be done to improve our education system for the future. It's Thank the you. most important thing for our economy. We must now make that happen by applying the reforms that we know can work. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon, for raising questions. What I'd like to do is to go back again to panelists and then go to the audience, because uh, Gordon has raised two or three questions, and I'd like to ask one each to uh, the panelists. And about the uh, uh, Dr. Tan of UNESCO, I'd like to ask about access. You mentioned that access and participation are increasing, but Gordon mentioned the other way. What is going on and what is uh, UNESCO trying to do? Well, actually, we're not conflicting each other. We work together. Uh, UNESCO <laughs> does, a, does a great uh, job. But, yeah. Thank you, you for you, asking you. a special <laughs> voice. We're trying to complement each other anyway. Yes. Thought. Um, actually, no, if you compare, let's say, 20 years ago when the Education for All started, mm -hmm. by that time, Education for everybody almost was a dream. Mm. But today, yes, if you, you look at the figures, it's, it, it did increase. But of course, they, today still have a 66 million ch children still out of school today. And I have a 770 million adult people cannot read and write. So there's still challenges there. So that is the unfinished business. Okay. That's exactly why U.S. Secretary General launched his new initiative together mm. with uh, Mr. Brown, UNESCO, mm. or try to fight. 
Okay, so Dr. Tan of uh, National University of Singapore. <clears throat> Gordon mentioned about the changes you know, not happening so much in educational model. And uh, Dr. Tan mentioned about the conservativeness of the educational body. How do you argue that? Well, it's true that uh, we face uh, tremendous challenges uh, to do this because uh, the faculty are usually very conservatizing. They're not going to rush out to do these things. But I uh, think a model of change that uh, find, we find works for us is really to uh, find a cluster of champions in uh, different parts of the institution and tools and support them to drive and demonstrate the value of what they're doing demonstrate efficacy in, through data, mm -hmm. and then make this known to the rest of the faculty. And the faculty are, by and large, very data-driven. And if you are able to demonstrate that a, a particular technique uh, really makes a difference, then it becomes much easier to move them. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, So the, the sense that we have is you need, uh, first, to have leadership, uh, a vision that is prepared to take... Uh, the required amount of time to transform the way mm -hmm. teaching occurs. You need the technology platforms, that's usually the easier part of the mm -hmm. problem. And then you need the champions in a cluster with enough demonstration project, uh, power and then to, to propagate the change throughout. And I would say that this is uh, aided uh, considerably by the fact that today as we, are, uh, as we hear from uh, Mark, uh, there's a lot of talk about the digital tsunami. Sure. Uh, you know, disruptive changes coming to education mm -hmm. through uh, online uh, types of uh, innovations uh, in uh, edX uh, with MIT and Harvard, with mm -hmm. Coursera out of Stanford. Mm -hmm. uh, I think these are leading a lot of university presidents and faculty to start to rethink about the model of education. Mm -hmm. And I think this will have a, actually a, a much a, an accelerating cumulative effect mm -hmm. on the way uh, universities around the world think about this. And over time, I think there'll be a momentum built up, sure. which will make it easier for us to uh, lead on these changes. Okay, Mark, you know, um, Dr. Tan mentioned about digital tsunami, lots of like uh, artificial intelligence and so forth. And Gordon mentioned about leadership. How do you implement by combining all those like, a, like a digitalization and implement that so that you know, the university can change? I think that's the great question. Universities and higher education, other education, it's, um, the institutions are, are fairly conservative and hard to change. Mm -hmm. There's the old joke that it took uh, 40 years to move the overhead projector from bowling alleys into the classroom, and, uh, well, maybe a little bit exaggerated. These are technologies which potentially, at least, really do, as the Prime Minister indicated, redefine the role of the, of the teacher, and that it's not necessarily the sage on the stage, and it's not all going to be lecture-based. And for, uh, it's, it's going to be perhaps much more personalized, much more adapted to the individual students, but it's going to require a very different way of thinking about how a teacher optimally functions. How to move from where we are into, such a, uh, into that framework is, I think, the most difficult thing to contemplate. It could be disruptive in a very non-smooth way, perhaps. Okay. Very good. I'll go back to Dr. Tan later on, but you know, let me ask Shantana about, you know, Gordon mentioned about technology. Can technology do a good job in terms of educating people? I no, I would say, um, Yoshi, that do we really have an option? Mm. Because I think if you look back over the past uh, few hundred years, mm. as Gordon rightly mentioned, we have not changed. And the result of not taking some decisions in terms of mass education or bringing more technology into education, we now have to pay the price of being conservative. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that the universities have been conservative. Mm -hmm. I think governments across the world have been conservative. Regulators have been conservative. They have stifled private investment in education. Mm -hmm. And today we are sitting on the brink of an international demographic disaster. Mm -hmm. It should have been a demographic dividend mm -hmm. because these millions of kids who do not get the opportunity for either school education or university education mm -hmm. are essentially contributing to a lot of social uh, conflict mm -hmm. around the world. So the old models mm -hmm. are not going to work. Okay. The old model is you go, you make a school and you make a university. Mm -hmm. It's going to take decades to do that. Okay. And before, we don't really have the luxury of that time. Mm -hmm. So the point is we have no option but to rethink 
everything. Mm. So the 21st century or the 22nd century education model is to essentially take some bold decisions and change everything. So okay. you have to change the way you deliver education. Mm. And that's where online education, mobile technologies, that's where uh, online learning is going to play such an important role. Mm. But you also have to change the business model for technology, mm. uh, okay. for, for education. And, and changing the business model for education involves rethinking public-private partnership mm -hmm. uh, in, in a very uh, okay. fundamental uh, manner. Sure. Dr. Kutan, quickly. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I just want to add that uh, another powerful uh, impetus for change is that the students are going to make us change. Mm, okay. uh, today, we, in, at least in the developed world, I sure. mean, mm. uh, people are not born with silver spoons in their mouth, they're born with iPhones in their hands. <laughs> and uh, you know, students are used to getting information from all kinds of sources, and when they enter schools and universities, they're going to expect the same. And so if the university or the school is unable to provide the... Uh, the level of information, the quality of delivery, they will find it elsewhere. Okay, good. And so I think the, the, they will be a potent force of change as okay. well. Good. Well, I'll get back to you later on, whether or not you're convinced or not. <laughs> but all I'd like to do is to engage the audience. And I'd like to ask four or five questions, like, please be briefly, and we will get back and then ask the panelists again. So uh, over there, the, the lady over there in, in front. Uh, uh, I'm a fan uh, of uh, uh, like Mr. to Mr. ask Mr. Mr. Gordon Brown. Okay. Um, as we know, the traditional uh, degree that people get from the university could be seen as the certification of their education background. However, what you mentioned that the long distance education degree hasn't been recognized and accepted by the majorities. So that is reality. So um, how do you think this phenomenon? Thank you. Okay. Let, let me Let's okay. ask four or five other questions. Okay, uh, the gentleman in the front, like uh, over there, yes. Over there. Hi, I have a question to all of you. So, uh, the youth un unemployment is soaring all over the world, and I think uh, this is partly because of the gap between what's taught in education and what's needed by companies. So my question is, how can we accelerate the speed of the change that you discussed in this panel in education, which has been quite sluggish over the years? Very Thank good you. Question. Okay, who else? Like uh, this gentleman over here. Yes, over here. Gentleman, over here. W one question. Uh, competition, private enterprise. My home country, Sweden, 99.8% of all went to one school system in 1992. Now we're opened up for competition. Private enterprise is getting in. We are disrupting classes. We are building completely new things. When will the planned economy controlled by politicians and education move to the private sector and the talents of the private sector can improve it? Okay. Okay, uh, I think there's a global shape in the, in the, yes, over there. Um, I agree that the future of education um, is going to be online and cloud-based, but do you think there's any danger in moving towards that direction in terms of losing the ability to teach skills like teamwork, communications, um, and things like that will promote more entrepreneurship um, and innovation? Okay, one more question I'll, I'll ask. There are lots of hands up. <laughs> okay, uh, the gentleman over there. Over there, yes. David Campbell, Bannerman, MEP. Um, can I ask, uh, Switzerland has the largest per capita income in the world, and yet comparatively it has less people in higher education, more in vocational. Is the lesson that we need less degrees and more skills training? Okay, so first of all, I think there's a, a question addressed to Gordon about uh, the, the lady, and then also you know, the question about the private sector, like a public sector to private sector. Please touch upon that. Mm. Well, I, I may be the least qualified to answer about the future shape of universities, but mm. the first question was about that. Uh, mm. And let me say, I think there are huge and exciting models for the way universities are going to develop that are now being either piloted or, or discussed, and we've heard some of it here. Uh, you've got the global university where you could enter from different parts of the world, different portals in different parts of the world, uh, and you can do courses in different countries to make up the single degree. 
and I think that will become very common. That will be mixed with some of the courses being online rather than uh, in a campus, and that will be one of the changes that will come out as well. And I think that those countries that continue to restrict uh, universities to a particular national version that is got to be followed irrespective will, will lose out. So I, I think the experimentation, the piloting of new models, the use of uh, online technology will become very widespread. Uh, and it may be, of course, that a lot of the information that I would have got as a student when I was a student could have come online. I still think, and this was the point that was being made earlier, uh, that the experience of, of learning, um, the tutoring that comes from a university is going to be important. And can I just make one final point about the structure of jobs, because that's what was being raised as well. Uh, as the structure of occupations change, then the need for rote learning and the rewards for memorizing and the rewards uh, for manual dexterity uh, will become less. But the skills that will be required in decision-making in recognizing patterns, so to speak, and in communications will be valued more. And so our universities and our institutions of primary, secondary, and higher education will have to adapt to that need in the occupational market where IT and computers are going to be able to do a large number of tasks that were previously uh, jobs for people. Uh, but at the same time, there'll be certain things, of course, that cannot be done and where training in wisdom, in decision-making, in recognizing processes and patterns, and in communication is going to be very important. So a lot of education will focus on these things, I think, in future. Okay, uh, who wants to talk about youth unemployment? Like uh, maybe Mark or Dr. Tan? Mark. I'll just say one quick thing. You, you know, I think that at least in the United States case, the gap is uh, not as subtle as the good question suggests, that there's a subtle gap between skills and needs. There's a, there's a major gap. In the United States, most of our urban school systems do not get even 30 percent of eighth graders through algebra. That's the nature of the gap. And so we're not training people who are set for a 21st century uh, 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 economy. And if I could just very briefly ask the, uh, say something about the very good question of teamwork and so forth, I think there are ways that teamwork can be done through teams that are scattered at a distance. A lot of work these days is working with people at a distance, uh, and it has the advantage of uh, transcultural uh, options as well. But the underlying thing of your point, I think, is very true. Not all of these things can be done with online learning, uh, and, and lectures certainly not. And um, things uh, that, that what I think one finds is that the best approach is, is typically blended. And I think that the future that one can imagine out there is not going to be one that's all one thing, but it's going to take advantage of a bunch of different approaches. Dr. Tan, do you want to yeah. like, add? I think on the issue of employment and the nexus of education, clearly there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. And uh, you really need to tailor it to the uh, nature of your economy and the likelihood of uh, job creation. So uh, Singapore, for example, has a, a significant manufacturing capacity about 25% of our GDP, and therefore we actually have retained polytechnics, which are post-secondary education, as a way of uh, you know, training people up for very good jobs uh, with a lot of opportunities for employment advancement. Uh, and uh, that has uh, meant that we've been able to keep unemployment at a very low rate. I think there's also the issue of time frame of consideration. Uh, here we're trying to balance uh, training people to be employable through a lifetime. And yet, how to also train a person to be employable and functional for the first job. And it's very hard to have a plug-and-play uh, engineer or anything uh, coming out straight away. And so when we train people to be able to process information, make sense of information, there's a slight trade-off. And uh, we try to match this uh, by having internships and industry types of uh, advisor, advise, advisories so that we can tailor the last year of education to better fit with the industry needs. But I, I think we, one has to take a longer term <coughs> view in terms of uh, the preparation for individuals to be able to, with some appropriate level of uh, shorter training, move into new jobs because then that gives you a lot more flexibility as an individual and also gives the economy a lot more flexibility in terms of human resource deployment. 
Okay, do you want to talk about uh, one, of the, uh, one of the successful models in the area of skills development using technology has really been to bridge the gap between where the jobs are and where the students or where the candidates are located. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing increasing use of uh, technology mm -hmm. in creating tele-education networks that have proved to be very successful because in most countries in the world the jobs are clustered in few locations whereas people who want to get those jobs are spread across the entire country. Um, so using tele-education networks, for example, in India uh, has proved to be a huge success mm -hmm. because not only do you bridge that gap, that physical divide, but you also take very high quality trainers which, which are always a scarce resource mm -hmm. and you put them in front of a camera and you broadcast mm -hmm. that lecture across the country, you also allow to scale up the human capital in terms of trainers, which is, which is a globally scarce resource. Two questions are not yet answered. So Dr. Tan, maybe to talk about, one is about the public sector, you know, when the private sector is going to play a major role. And he talked about like a socialist model of education. What could be done? Do you want to talk about that or do you want to talk more about the degree, this degree? A private sector's uh, okay. involvement. Uh, but this is a kind of a new way uh, today we're observing in many countries. Uh, more and more government want to have a partnership with private sectors. Mm -hmm. Uh, mainly not only for actually for getting more funding. More importantly is to let them to tell education people what kind of a skill and people education mm -hmm. system need to train. And today we find it really, like for example, uh, those big companies we are working with like uh, Microsoft, like uh, uh, Nokia, they all get this involved with the global education. And then this is also their responsibility. So mm -hmm. for us, but it's not only for the funding, as we said. Now, they are more and more involved with the uh, uh, education people to tell them what exactly what's happening in the new uh, mm -hmm. technology fund, what is really a new skill today we need. For example, we need the digital mm -hmm. knowledge, right? We need all the diversified mm -hmm. skills. So those are things really important to have the private sectors get involved. And this is today, uh, to me, is one of the key um, factor if we want to push education for all, not only the government, but private sector is so important. That's why we will sure. work on that. Uh, in case of Japan, like, uh, uh, because you know, there's a huge government deficit, I think in, it, turn, it happens in most of the advanced nations that uh, deregulation has to be needed, more private sectors, and more uh, you know, dynamic you know, entrepreneurs have to come in. I think that's the movement, that's the trend is going on. The gentleman raised a very interesting point about what is, you know, how come you have to make so much like higher education? You know, like in the case of Switzerland or maybe in Germany, you know, more vocational education is more needed. And in terms of higher education, like universities may not be suiting to the uh, you know, real world. Who would argue that? Like who would raise, like uh, who would talk about that? I'll, I'll make a very quick okay. uh, comment on that as an organization that has one foot in, you know, both these domains. Mm -hmm. I think we have to we shouldn't think in terms of these two being separate buckets. Mm -hmm. I think higher education has to become more vocational, mm -hmm. and vocational education has to become more comprehensive. Okay. So I think the, the solution for the 21st century is really a blend of both. Mm -hmm. The moment we start thinking about this is degree and this is vocational education, mm -hmm. we are already putting ourselves uh, in a box. Okay. And some of the successful models today actually break that conceptual barrier. Mark and Dr. Tan, do you agree? Well, I think um, my sense is uh, more like different pathways okay. may be required uh, so the individuals can move so that it doesn't mean that if you don't get a degree, mm -hmm. there's the end of your life, which is uh, quite often the sentiment in many parts of Asia, that the degree is the end in itself. is actually not. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, I think we need to create more pathways. Some people can go into non-degree bearing uh, technical education, mm -hmm. spend a few years in industry, take a degree, move into a different job. Mm -hmm. And I think creating many different pathways, each which can fit into some economic need, I think that would be the way in which, uh, you know, it would give us more resilience overall in the system. Okay, there are lots of hands raised. Okay, uh, one lady in the front, and maybe one gentleman who is standing up as well. Like the first lady in the front. Okay, thank you. I prefer to ask, ask my question in Chinese. Okay. May I? 
Um, 我想问在座的几位男士, Female agenda. for female yes. or higher for yes. the male. So how can we face this challenge? In the back, raising uh, yes over there, the guy, the guy over there who is standing oh. up over there. <laughs> I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andrea. I'm a global shaper. And uh, one day I was asked, who was your best teacher? Mm. And I thought about it only a few seconds. The reply was, actually, it was a peer, and he was younger than me. Probably one of the reasons why I'm here today, it's because this guy inspired me. So my question is, what is the role of young people in education, in teaching, actually? Um, what is the role of young people in reshaping the education system? Are we going to ask them what they want, how they want, education to be. Thank okay. you very much. Interesting. The lady talked about gender, and then uh, Global Shaper talked about young uh, people teaching. One more question. Okay, over there. Yes. Thank you. Um, Gordon mentioned earlier on that education is the most important driver for the economy. And it's interesting here at the World Economic Forum, whatever someone is talking about is really important. Uh, health is really important. Education is really important. And the question I have is, what are we willing to eliminate? What of the important things should we not do to be able to make significant progress in education? It's a question to all of you, but that inspired it. Okay, so we have five plus more minutes. And what I would like to do is to ask each panelist to comment on the questions and also comment on final remarks with one minute each. <laughs> so why don't we start with Dr. Tan? Why not? Uh, what to eliminate, I guess, uh, is going to be a, 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 tr a big trade-off, but we, I think we need to be more productive. As uh, Mark says, we've got to find ways to maintain quality, but uh, at a larger scale, requiring less inputs. Uh, and in that way, we might be able to... Uh, balance the, the needs across a broad spectrum of different dimensions. I think the main, the main takeaway I get from this session really is uh, that um, the needs for developed and developing countries are, are very different. There are technologies, uh, there are innovations and pedagogies, and we really need, uh, in a sense, to have a menu of uh, innovations uh, that are happening in different places so that uh, countries or places, institutions that are looking for different types of solutions would have some kind of resource uh, to guide them as to different approaches that might be applicable for their situation. Because in the end, uh, everybody has to create their own solutions specific to their needs and to where they want to go. Okay, Mark. So um, I'd like to begin with uh, just a word or two about the comment on uh, peer interactions and the, the role of interaction with uh, one's fellow students. We talked a little bit about how teachers' roles are going to have to change. There's tremendous evidence that suggests that interacting with your peers is one of the best ways to learn. In fact, a lot of uh, evidence shows that one of the best ways to teach uh, a student is to ask that student to try to formulate the lesson for one of his friends, or one, one, one of her friends. And I think that this reconceptualization of the role of all the players is, 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 is surely one of the opportunities and challenges before us. And then to summarize, I, I, I think there is a tremendous set of opportunities to find ways where we don't have to sacrifice not doing one thing because uh, it's too expensive to do other things. There's got to be ways to try to make the educational process more cost effective. One of the great opportunities we've talked about online learning and so forth, but we're entering a, a phase where not only will this occur in the cloud, but our capabilities in dealing with huge amounts of data, so-called big data, is pr progressing in fabulous ways where we're going to have so much more ability 
to figure out more easily what really is effective and try to take advantage of that as we move forward. Thank you. Dr. Tang? Just uh, quickly, two points. The first one about it, just uh, uh, gender equity, which is, this is really a challenge. It's a universal. It's not only in China. Uh, I have to tell you, it is uh, almost, we've been trying for this for 20 years in UNESCO, we're talking to all Minister of Education. Everybody agreed with us. Of course, then they still have a long way to go. Uh, so need this, this specific uh, measures. Uh, the last point I want to make is about the vocation education. Today, I met so many ministers of education, and I asked them, what are the challenges? They always answer, the first challenge for them is the teacher. The second is always the vocational skills. And of course, they got the pressure from to have a, to find a way to train the young people to get a job. Mm -hmm. But the final point is, to creating a job is not education can do. <laughs> it's economic people. So this is the okay. boring. Thank you. Okay. Shatna? Yeah, and I'll make a quick point about, uh, you know, the comment on young people. Um, my organization works with about 22 million, and all of them are below the age of about 18. And one of the things that we observe is the young people are very smart. Hmm. They will find the way that they can learn better. So they are, uh, they are, in fact, I would say, learning today in spite of the education system, not because of the education system. And if you see the amount of education that is going on today on Skype, on Facebook, on various cooperative uh, learning platforms, I think technology has a game-changing role to play here. Uh, some of the things that educationists have always dreamed of, but it's never been possible to do. Uh, for example, how do you do self-paced learning? You can't do that when you put 40 kids inside one classroom and put one teacher to do the job. That's where technology comes and uh, plays a really important role. How do you do cooperative learning, especially when you want to do cooperative learning across uh, provincial borders or across uh, global borders and some of the first people to take advantage of these new technologies are going to be the young people below the age of 18. So these people uh, are already finding their way. They are leveraging technologies in ways that the inventors of those technologies never dreamed that they would be used in, in, in that uh, particular manner. A quick comment also on the, on the issue of gender. Now that's an issue that really is important in the country that I come from, India. And there are, uh, you know, for traditional reasons, for historical reasons, for religious reasons, uh, the girl child has been so disadvantaged in India. And I think there, there, you just don't need, it's not only the government that has to step in, I think civil society uh, has to step in. And you cannot talk about future of education if you're not talking of 50% of uh, humanity. And outside the big cities, if you go down to the villages, I think that's a very serious issue that we cannot ignore. Uh, at all. Yeah. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, I think the same, the same point uh, in our country, in Britain, because of the investment in girls uh, equivalent to the investment in boys, girls now do better in schooling, they get better qualifications, they've got most of the university degrees, uh, they are the people who enter the professions more than uh, men do now, whether it's law, accountancy, uh, or other uh, professions like medicine uh, and therefore those countries that fail to develop the potential of their girls and women are really doing not only these girls and women a disservice but doing a huge disservice to the future of their countries. Uh, I just give you one example in South Sudan which I just visited. 400 girls only in secondary education at 14 and 15 in a country of 10 million people when there should be 150,000 girls if it was the correct uh, pro rata rate. And so a one in 400 chance of getting uh, senior uh, secondary education in a country like South Sudan, such as the discrimination that still exists. So we have to do better. I think we probably spend on average about $400 for the whole education of the typical African girl. And we spend about $100,000 for the education of a child in, in, in America or in Europe. Uh, and therefore the inequality is such uh, that we are denying a whole generation of people chances if we don't take action. And my point is it's to the detriment of the whole economy and the whole society and not just something that is so unfair to an individual that we should feel angry about it in the first place. So uh, I do agree uh, that we need to do more to promote girls' and women's education. Well, this has been a very stimulating and inspiring discussion. 
the topic of education, you can see that the, you know, the whole room is packed. And it shows that education has a strong you know, interest to other people. I believe that education has a strong power to change people and at the same time create jobs as well and also change the society as well. And the topic about future of education, I have learned from the, this uh, discussion that uh, it's uh, so diverse. I think it's good to have a diverse suppliers of education, like education providers, supply different business models, universities, vocational studies, and then at the same time, different choices of the people who are choosing what uh, career to take. And so that I think the you know, way to go may be deregulation, de more diversity, and more different ideas, and then more different business models, both private and public sectors. And then at the same time, leadership is required. I hope that all of you who are here today will do something better for the future of education. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah.